Hey guys, how are you doing? It's Amy back again for another Friday. And I have a question for you. Where are you joining from today? And more importantly, what is the temperature in your area? I would like to know if you are sweltering in heat like I am, or whether you have a nice breeze going on in the 70s, that would be nice right now. We have a hot 80, high of 89 today and uh, 90s through the weekend and even into next week. You know, if you've been here for a while, you know that I used to complain about it being cold in my studio because I started in the fall and then it got colder and colder. We're now in season three. And now I'm complaining that it's freaking sweltering in my studio. My studio is 86 degrees. Make that 87. 87 degrees in a bedroom in my top level of my townhouse right now. Because <laughs> heat rises. <laughs> so where are you joining from today and what is the temperature outside? <clears throat> okay. Kay, what are you asking? Did you miss what, Kay? Let me know. Meryl is saying Oakland, California is 65. Thanks, Meryl. Thanks for that. 65 is a little chilly. Little chilly. Here we go. Nikolai. Hashtag legals Nikolai. Previous guest on this show. New York City, 86 feels like 89. Yeah, so we have similar because we're on the East Coast, right? Let's see. Sarah's saying Chicago and 90 feels like 97. Wow. I shouldn't feel bad about my 86, right? Okay, Kimberly. Oh, good. I should move to Seattle. A wonderful 58 degrees in Seattle. All right, Adrian, future guest on the show, uh, is in Houston, 90 degrees. Yeah, but it's, um, I think it's a different kind, right? You guys don't have the uh, humidity that we have. Um, oh, I get to be reminded that Bob's in Seattle. Hey, Bob, good to see you. Mid-60s, rain expected. It's always cold and rainy just before 4th of July. Hopefully, you have a nice 4th of July and it's not cold and rainy. Um, Merrill's, well, yeah, but going to 80 degrees tomorrow. Okay, so 65 today, 80 for the weekend. That's pretty awesome. Okay, so while you guys are answering that question, um, I just want to say, did I miss teaching at Georgetown? So for those of you that don't know, for five and a half years, almost six years, I taught in the Georgetown University Paralegal Program. And I taught, um, started out as one semester, then it went to two, and then it eventually was three. So it was a three semester year long program and I ended up teaching in all three semesters. And I just realized this morning that it's almost a year, August will be a year, since I last taught a class and the Georgetown Paralegal Program because they decided to cancel it after like 25 years of having the paralegal program. 25 years of students coming through the program, learning how to be a paralegal, learning from me for the last, you know, five and a half legal technology, no more. And it makes me sad because I really, I'm still in touch with a bunch of my students because, you know, I'm a people person. Um, and I just miss the new batch of students. I used to call them sponges. And I miss the teaching and interacting with them Thursday nights, you know. I get, I'm just having, I'm just missing it. So, Bob, I'm jealous that you're still doing it. Um, Sydney, joining from Washington, D.C., and it's 80 degrees. So you're similar to me because I'm in Maryland. B is in Minneapolis, where my guest is today. Currently 93, headed to 98. Holy moly. Rick. Lewiston. Lewiston. Lewiston, Maine. 80s. Well, that's doable. I have some friends in the, in the Boston area. See, low 80s, 75. You know, 75. I don't know. I really prayed. For those of you that have been here for a while, you know that I was complaining that I was always cold because I hate being cold. And now I don't like being sweaty and hot and ugh. And that we have a lot of humidity in Maryland, so it just makes it worse. Okay, 
thank you guys for answering the question of the day. We're going to go ahead and get started here. Welcome to the Legal Tech Mastery Show. My name is Amy Bowser Rollins, and I'm really glad that you're here with us today, meaning me and my guest, Wade. And we talked on this show about technology in the legal industry and also uh, a career in the legal industry. We end up talking about career stuff too, like last week where Kathleen was here and we talked a lot about some advice for getting into a job, you know, pros and cons of things you should do. So today I want to welcome Wade Peterson. Wade, how are you? Good, thank you. So Wade uh, and I have known each other for a long time, many, many years, but we've never met in person. We need to change that, Wade. Yeah. Um, but uh, he also, when I started the show, um, is a regular, I'll call him a regular, and uh, he comments a lot, which is awesome, and he cracks me up. He has a great sense of humor, and I always appreciate when people have a good sense of humor, especially in the legal tech industry. Right, Wade? Do you agree? Yes, yes. I've been a lurker for many, many shows. <laughs> okay, so Jason's saying happy Friday. Happy Friday to you too, Jason. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. Um, we're going to geek out today with some of your favorite tools, some of which I know of and some of which I don't. Um, and, you know, that's what we always say in litigation support. You only know the tools that you've become aware of, either by where you went to work because they have tools, or someone just tells you, or you Google. You know, we, all, we don't know. There's no way to know all the tools in litigation support. There's just no way to do it. So having a network of people that you can learn from. So that's what we're going to do today. And here we go, John Randall. John's a longtime friend of mine. Good to see you here, John. Um, so... Wade, go ahead and tell us what your career path has been so far in the legal industry. Well, I've been in the legal industry, I guess, a long time. Uh, I started way back in 1972 uh, with West Publishing Company, uh, where I was a programmer. And when I first started at West, uh, there were about 12 people in the programming department. Um, now I think they have like 3,000 people in the programming department or, or even more. Um, but when I first got started with computers, they really weren't available. PCs weren't available. So the first machine that I worked on was called a IBM 402 accounting machine. And you actually wired that, hardwired that with little jumper cables to write your programs. And in those days, programmers were paid by the pound because the more wire that was on the board, the more complex the program was. So wow. they got paid by the pound back then. And then I worked on an IBM 1620 computer. So I, I did a lot of development work at West. Uh, I was a creator of a product called WestCheck, which some of you may know about. I uh, did citation checking with Westlaw. I did some uh, Westlaw programming and put some systems in Westlaw for them. And then I got the opportunity to move to a law firm as the director of IT because they wanted to put in a network and they had Wang VS computers and they didn't know anything about networking and I did. So I started at, uh, at Fager and Benson and was their director of IT for 16 years uh, and open offices all over the world and uh, had a great time and loved that job. And then uh, after 16 years, I wanted to do something different. And so I, uh, I had a great friend in the, and she owned a litigation support company and invited me to come over there and learn about this field called litigation support. And it looked challenging, it looked interesting, it, it looked fun. And so I did that for a few years and then I uh, got the opportunity to start uh, a litigation support department within a law firm and did that for five years. And then I've come over to uh, Fredrickson and Byron now and pretty much have kind of developed the litigation support department within the firm here as well. And I got a great staff of people and it's been fun. Okay, so a couple things there. I have a student, a former Georgetown student who's now at Fager, um, been there a few years. And then uh, I started on Wang. My first, 
well, I went from typewriter in my first law firm to the Wang. Um, so we're both dating ourselves. Yeah. And one question I have is a lot of people that switch from IT to lit support when they're dealing directly with the attorneys in a, you know, in a case related way, instead of an infrastructure related, related way, what was your first, like in your first year of doing litigation support in a law firm, or maybe even when you were at the um, service provider with your friend, what was your first instinct going from the IT world to litigation support? I want to see if it's similar to some of my friends. Uh, I'd say it's a lot more time sensitive and stressful in that regard. Um, you know, with IT, you can set milestones and project delivery dates. And if you miss those dates, well, you know, there's some consequences, but not dire consequences. So I just kind of felt like the pressure was always on in the litigation support. But, you know, I kind of enjoy pressure. I thrive on pressure and I thrive on the challenges of, you know, we need to do X, Y, and Z, and it's never been done before. So how can you do this? You know, can and I'm still doing that today. Yeah. I had a one of my staff came over to me yesterday and asked me about a challenging question, and you know, within a few minutes, we came up with a kind of a unique solution to to solve this problem. And I think my development and uh, programming background has helped me uh, tremendously in that regard. Okay. Yeah. So um, you almost said the same thing, which is. You said it from the front end when in IT you can plan your projects and they're over time and you have sort of some control over it. Um, and litigation support, you almost have no control when they're going to show up on your door and they may have known about something for a while but, you know, forgot to tell you. Um, yeah. And then everything is a rush. There's no like, yeah. you know, can we plan this out and get this done over the next three months like an IT thing would be. It's always like, I know I'm just telling you about this, but I need it yesterday. Yeah. So it's an adjustment that, for IT people usually. That's one of the things about lawyers that I've always been puzzled at is that, you know, how do they not plan ahead mm -hmm. for their trials or depositions or whatever? It always seems to be the last minute. And they, they always think that if we just push a button, it'll happen magically. Right. Hey, Rebecca, good to see you. Um, okay, so... We have a couple of tools that you, um, I asked you what you were passionate about sharing and you gave me a list of mm -hmm. stuff and that's cool. So um, we're going to start out talking about a tool that you developed uh, that your team is using. So let's go ahead and tell us a little bit about what it's called and how it helps. Yeah, so one of the things we do obviously is we uh, work with DAT files, which are the concordance load files that we use for our uh, document review process. And we use text editors like everybody else in the field uses text editors. And for those of you who are, who are in litigation support, you know that the, the uh, standard concordance delimiters can be challenging at times to work with in a text editor. And we often use Excel to edit our data because it's fielded data, and that's what a DAT file is. It's a metadata field. So we, uh, we can't import DAT files directly into Excel because Excel's text import doesn't allow those special characters. And so what I did is I created a new Excel add-in, which is called DAT Daddy. Came up with that fun little name. <laughs> and DAT Daddy is just an add-in to Excel. It's a very simple program. Uh, it allows you to import and export uh, DAT files using the standard concordance delimiters. You can see the comma, quote, and new line characters. Or you can use pretty much any delimited characters. You can define any delimited characters that you want. So you can import the DAT file directly, work it in Excel, you know, delete some columns, delete some rows, do some calculations, do some formulas, do whatever you need to do, search and replace, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure we all have uh, multiple Excel skills that we use. And then when you're all done, you can just export the DAT file and it puts back in the delimiters and you're all set to go. So it's a quick, very easy way to get data into Excel and get data out of Excel. And it's cheap, $39.95, one-time cost, license per machine, and we use it every day. We use it multiple times a day for, for a variety of things. Um, we had a situation yesterday where we had a Word document and it had data in two different columns and it had new line characters in one of the columns. And those had to be imported into our review platform. And so we were able to cut and paste the data from Word, put it in Excel, 
uh, export with Dat Daddy, which had the delimiters. Then we brought it up in our editor, did a search and replace, quick search and replace on the new line characters, got rid of the new line characters, and uh, brought it back in, and uh, it was ready to go. So within 10 minutes, uh, we took a Word document and tables that would have been extremely time-consuming to do it manually. Yep. So. Okay. Hey, Kimberly. Hey. Kimberly's a regular you, Kimberly. uh, viewer of the show. She says she loves it. Uh, Lana, I don't know if you know Lana from Women in E-Discovery. Um, she loves the yeah. name. I'm pretty good at coming up with acronyms for names, so I get a little bit creative there. Then that's great. People saying that's great. I'm, I'm assuming that means that he's used it. Um, and then Unkit, my team member in India, is letting me know he's here. Hey, Unkit. Thanks for staying up late. So I'll give a plug for my website. It's www.enfdiscovery.com. And you can go there and you can download a trial version of Dat Daddy, which allows you to do 10 documents. And then if you like it, you can just purchase it right online on that uh, website. So I thought it's a nice little utility. I wanted to make it available to everybody because I know our jobs are very difficult. And why not make something that's simple and easy for people to do their job better and faster? Yeah, I mean, um, we're always looking for shortcuts and tips and tricks to do, do the repetitive things that we do all the time. A little bit more efficiently and yeah I've always wished that we had this master um, it doesn't exist there's pieces that exist but like so, a master GUI software of all the text manipulation things that we do in litigation support like it's yeah. cool to have one tool that knows you know there's a front end that's you know nice and easy to use and it just lets us choose all the things we need to do uh, well google is my friend when it comes to utilities and um i'm sure i'm not unlike many of the litigation support people that when a problem arises i'm out on google trying to find this solution or that solution and you know the trouble is there's so many solutions that yeah. You download three or four of them, they work or they don't work, and you know finally you find the one little nugget that, that seems to work, and that's the one you go with. But you only use it once or twice, and then you're off to the races looking for the next solution. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. So. Uh, when I was doing the Fast Tip Friday videos, I was looking for things like that. Things I, you know, once I got through the list of things I already knew, I started looking for other things. And that's exactly right. And I found some free stuff that does some pretty yeah. amazing stuff. And um, there's another guy, Sean, who has a blog. He's always finding things to uh, solve problems. He's a paralegal, but he's a he might as well be doing lit support. And he's in New York, and he he's very very smart, very very smart. And he yeah, always a lot of finds these solutions. A lot of the good paralegals uh, do like to get into litigation support. It's a nice career path for them, uh, as well as some of the attorneys who are more interested in e-discovery. So. Okay, so the next tool that you wanted to talk about is one of my favorites. Um, so let's talk about that one. Yeah, this is a standard tool that we use uh, pretty much daily. Uh, it's beyond compare. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Beyond Compare, it's basically a file synchronization copy tool. Uh, and it's probably one of the more powerful ones that we've found. We've evaluated many of them out there on the market. Beyond Compare does a nice job of not mucking up with the uh, metadata of files. So the modification dates stay the same as you're doing your synchronization of, of data. Uh, and we use it you know, pretty much like I say, daily because it's our standard copy utility anytime we get media in from outside it's copied up to our network for processing with beyond compare the reason i like it from a developer standpoint i guess is because you can actually call beyond compare from batch files and i'm kind of an old school dos person and i write a lot of batch files to do a lot of the functions that i need to do one of the things that i do is archiving and deleting data that's no longer needed on the network. And so I have several batch files that call out to beyond compare and you can pass it command line parameters and parameter files to tell it what to do. So I have to go out to multiple 
uh, folders on the network, various locations, and copy the data and delete it and get it over into a different archiving area. And I use Beyond Compare extensively to do that. In fact, we went to a new uh, storage area network, and I had to move 50 terabytes of data over to it from the old system. Yep. Uh, it took about six months to get that done. But Beyond Compare was the tool that ultimately I had to use to make sure it all got over there accurately. And um, I think it's still free. Last time I checked, I mean, I use it almost every day, and I'm not even on the job anymore. I use it my no, personal I, life. <laughs> yeah, I think it's I think it's uh, a paid for product now. Is it but it's twenty some dollars though. It's very very affordable. Uh, yeah, I think there's a there's a different levels. I think that you can get, but uh, it's well worth whatever it costs. Yeah. So okay, we use it um, all the time. I'm going to show this screenshot again because. One of the things that I like about it is the color coding. So you can yes. easily tell from left, you know, comparing, this is comparing two folders, for instance. Um, you know, what's missing from the left, what's missing from the right. And you can see the buttons in the toolbar up top are, um, some of them are depressed. So I use exclusions to exclude certain file types. And I sure. use the, um, the difference. I filter, see the uh, button that says diffs. I filter on like exactly how I want to see the data in the left or right columns. Like sometimes I want to see the folders. Sometimes I just want to see the files underneath the folders and it lets you do that. You know, it's very robust in what it allows you to do. <laughs> Let's see what Bob's saying. Bats in the belfry. I don't know why I said that. Oh my gosh. And I thought I cracked you up. Thanks, Bob. Uh, let's see, John. Beyond Compare is such a great tool. It's also a good tool for me to give to newbies because the, the daunting task of copying data. I mean, our, in litigation support, our life is copying data. Um, yep. And Beyond Compare gives you some sort of confidence because it shows you visually what may have not copied. It gives you errors if you didn't copy. It's just very, um, like I said, I use it... Um, I'm not even on the job and let's support anymore, and I have it installed at home. I use it all the time. Right. And then right. I'm a Mac person now, and they finally came out with a Mac version, so I totally oh, did Mac version. Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. Oh, it was a few years ago, and yeah, I'm so happy because yeah. I'm always on my Mac, and I want to use the same features. And I like the fact that it doesn't alter anything about the metadata of the file, and that's really important, as you know, in litigation support is that we don't change anything that yeah. we're working with. Yep. Okay, so hopefully you guys, if you're using Beyond Compare, like John said he was, uh, you like it as much as we do, but if you, oh, here's Kimberly. I love it because I can copy a batch of data and exclude the copying of certain file types. Yeah, like I yep. said. Yep. Yep. It's very flexible, and I think it's easy to use, you know, yeah. and they have some yeah. videos on it too. And if you guys are into batch file programming, uh, look into using the uh, Beyond Compare parameter files. It can be it can be very helpful, especially if you're doing repetitive tasks over and over again. And once you've kind of developed the workflow and developed the parameter files, um, you don't have to think about it again. It doesn't even call up the GUI. Uh, it just runs in, runs in a, a DOS window. Yeah, you that and you're mentioning where you call Beyond Compare from batch files. I haven't done any of that. You know, my brain doesn't yeah. work like yours. Um, yeah, it's a, a little more advanced feature of the of the software. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully if you didn't know about Beyond Compare, you'll run out and get it because it's um, definitely, like we're saying, we use it every day on the job. Okay, so the next one is when you had it on your list, I was like, well, okay, it's another renaming tool. You know, there's several. Mm -hmm. I did a survey of my audience years ago, and I asked them what tools they were using, and I had like, three or four come back in the renaming column, you know? Um, so it was interesting though, because this one's command line and I know now it makes sense for you, but what about mm -hmm. your team? So let's talk about this one for a second. Well, unfortunately, I still do a lot of work for the team um, when it comes to <laughs> the programming aspect of it. But I, I do look for tools that can be run from the command line, and I do look for tools that are oftentimes free. This one is a free tool. It's written in Java, actually. 
Uh, and I've looked at a lot of renaming tools. I know that Amy's got some suggestions for renaming tools. Uh, but this one, in my mind, has been the most powerful renaming tool that I've ever found. It's a little cryptic in how the command lines work. So you have to get used to the syntax of it. But for instance, it has enumeration. It has mathematics in it. So you can do calculations in your renaming. And for instance, you can name files by number if you want, or you can take a number within a file name and recalculate that with adding and subtracting, or you can get access to uh, variables and use variables, including the parent folder name or the existing name. Um, so it, it has just a whole bunch of capabilities that are built into it. I've used it to rename files based on enumeration. Uh, you know, with a Bates number of prefixing, for instance, I've used it in a very complex situation where we had uh, text files and native files in one directory, and the image files were in another directory, and I needed to move the text files and the native files into the correspondingly named image directory. And so just simply by renaming the files, it actually did the move of the file into the different subdirectories. So if it's on the same drive, just by renaming it to a different folder name, you can actually move the file. So it's very quick, very fast. I think I did like 300,000 files within about 10 seconds, renaming wow. and moving them. Yeah. Wow. So it's very powerful, very fast, and it, it, uh, it works very well. So if you can get used to cryptic syntax, uh, which I've gotten used to, and there's lots of examples on their website of showing these different things. But if you've got kind of a developer programmer a mindset, uh, you can really get it to do some very, very powerful renaming and, and moving and manipulation capabilities on it. Wow, okay. Let's say hi to Petra. She's coming from the Netherlands. Hey, oh my gosh. And Petra, actually, hi. she's in that category of what you just said. She's very hi, Petra. geeky and she, she can do her own programming on certain sorts. Um, and she does command line stuff all the time. Uh, I met her through oh, live streaming, and she does she does some amazing things, like you know, like we do in litigation support, finding a solution to a problem. And you said earlier that's one of your favorite things about litigation support. I totally agree. That's one of my favorite things too, because there's always well, a challenge coming towards you. Well, I love to go to garage sales because you never know what you can find at a garage sale. There's always a little nugget or a treasure that you find at a garage sale, and that's kind of like it is in litigation support. When you have a problem, you go and you try to find this little nugget out there, and so, you know, the, the hunt is almost as much fun as it is in finding the solution and implementing it. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Java rules, I mean, nice coding language and coffee. That <laughs> <laughs> has a good sense of humor, too. All right, so I'm going to show a screenshot of um, if you're afraid of the command line and you don't have a renaming tool or you're new to this idea of being able to mass rename files, I just want to put it out there that this is the one that I have uh, some Fast Tip Fridays about because, and it's, to me, it's busy looking in itself. You know, it's, it's a little overwhelming, but you can see there's a kabillion options of what you can do. Um, so I do yeah. have um, some Fast Tip Fridays on how to use it. Um, yeah, I've, I've looked at this tool, and uh, it is good for people that like more of a GUI interface. Um, again, you know, my background is development, so programming is kind of where I'm at. So it all depends on your point of view. Right. And if, I mean, if I had you in my office, I would say, you know, go ask Wade to solve that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, let's see. Petra says, who needs GUI when you can just do it with keys? Yeah, she's your new best friend. Uh huh. Oh, here's John. Unless the deadline is within an hour, depends. Yeah, that's he just true. said he did three hundred thousand things, and you know what was it? Ten seconds? Thirty seconds? Yeah, it was. yeah. It's a uh, it's it's a real race to the finish line on a lot of these projects. You know, you get this this question from one of the staff members, and you go, "Oh, I know I can do it. I know I can do it." But you need to give me like five minutes, you know. And you try this, and you try that, and you test it out, and all of a sudden it goes, "Oh." it's going to work yeah. <laughs> and, you, yeah. and you get it solved, you know, so that that's a lot of satisfaction of what I get. From yeah, doing that's a perfect it. example. And it's the thing that I try to teach newbies in Let's Support is that are, you know, curious about solving the problem is do your research, you know, give the attorney um, a deadline, get, you know, ask for some time to figure it out. 
then go do your research, try to figure it out, like you just said, but then figure out if you need to give up and just do it old school. Yep. <laughs> yep. So, Petra, I have no idea what that means, but you probably do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Petra works for a company that develops chips, like computer chips. <laughs> like potato chips? Computer chips. <laughs> okay, so the next one's kind of cool. The next two, um, well, this one I hadn't heard of. We have two more, you guys. So this one I hadn't heard of, and when I went to the website, I was intrigued. And then you're going to tell us how you use it. So go ahead. Yeah, this one, uh, we have a, a document review tool called Ringtail, which is a web-based tool. So it's all a web interface. And there are things that I like about Ringtail and things that I don't like about Ringtail. And the one thing I don't like about Ringtail is there's a lot of, not a lot of administrative tools to do certain things, and mm -hmm. per, in particular, do them in mass to multiple cases. So, you know, we have three 500 cases in Ringtail, and we did an upgrade uh, to Ringtail to the newer version, and all of a sudden we said, oh, we want to add this save search to our new clone. We have a clone database, and we clone it for, for new... Uh, databases and it has all the save searches in it for instance yeah. and we came up with a new save search and we said oh you know I need to go back to all those previous cases and add this save search to it or yeah. maybe a field you know or a field access security level change where I need to say you know this field now needs to be available to all the reviewers as well as the case managers or I I need to you know delete this data or I need to rename a field name because you know, I'm kind of anal about uh, having things be exactly the same. And I want it consistently, yeah, consistent from, from case to case. Yep. So I couldn't do it within the Ringtail interface, web interface itself. So I looked for basically a key keystroke macro tool. And some of you have probably looked at those and maybe even used one or two. This one, the Win Automation tool, is probably the most sophisticated and the most on steroid keyboard macro utility that you can find. And again, from a developer standpoint, uh, I was able to use it with my web tool because it can interact with the web interface. Obviously, it has mouse movements and keystrokes, but it goes well beyond that. It can actually read from an Excel file. So if you're looking for a uh, repetitive uh, thing, like I had to go through each one of the cases that I had to re, um, reassign and, and make changes to. So I made an Excel file with all the names of the cases. I wrote the program so that it had a loop in it and would read the name of the case from the Excel file, put that into the code, um, you know, other things like that. It can look on the screen. It can look for images on the screen. If it detects the image, you can do one action. Or if it's not there, you can do a different action. You can what do you key mean in image information. On the screen? What you oh, like if a dialog box, oh, if a dialog okay. box or an air pops right. up, yeah. I can, you know, I can handle that and yeah. say, oh, that that air message popped up, and therefore I need to do this, or I need to hit the escape key, or I need to click on this. Enter, you can, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you can have you can have coordinates on the on the system. So actually, one of the more sophisticated things I've done is, you know, a drop down dialog, for instance. I'll, I'll program it so that it clicks on the drop down. I will visually examine the screen looking for a certain drop down, and I will scroll the mouse down to that drop down to pick it from yeah. there. And I can do that all programmatically. Yeah. And uh, once you've got the program written, uh, you know, it's, it, you can run it hundreds and hundreds of times. And then the other nice thing is that you can compile these automation scripts into exe files so, so they can be. Can yeah, so the yeah. teams can run them. Yeah. yeah, so I've done it. I've done probably a hundred different web automation macros that do various things to upgrade things. I've used it to enter time and billing information into Elite. Uh, I've used it to automate the creation of tickets within our ticketing system. So really, anything that you can imagine that you want to be able to do with either a web-based interface or even an application interface, because you can launch applications. And then you can basically operate them uh, robotically uh, with so, this tool. So this is a screenshot from their features page, but it goes on and on and on. If you scroll, 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 there's a bunch of, what do they call these, modules or apps within the app? Or 
yeah, these are kind of scripts. So you have these little robot scripts that you write. And again, it's a programming language that you have to learn. And, uh, you know, you can have timers. So, you know, you have a wait for three seconds and then, uh, you know, move the mouse to this X, Y coordinate or moves it, move it in relationship to or look for an image on the screen. Or, you know, if this dialog box prop pops up, push on this button. And all those things are built into the language that, they, that comes with the tool. So it's very, very powerful. So all those apps or scripts, whatever, that are on that long page, how many of them would you say you use? There's like, I think, 15 or 20 of them. Do you just go into the application and choose one of those scripts and then go from there? Well, their pre-canned applications don't apply to me, so I usually okay. have to start off from scratch. So I've had develop uh, little subroutines. For instance, I have a subroutine to log on to Ringtail, and I just call that routine from any new script that I encounter. Um, I was going to say, you can't log into Ringtail yourself? Okay. Well, I do it programmatically. Process. It's part of a process. I do it programmatically. Um, so, you know, it just saves me steps. Of course. Anything that will save me steps and time. Especially repetitive. All right, so Meryl yeah, is on the West Coast. She's saying she can't wait to try it. Um. And there's really no way that I could have done this any other way. There's just, you know, I would have had to pay the vendor to go into the back end databases and you know I think one time they they quoted a script in SQL for me and I think they wanted fifteen thousand dollars to do the script and it was just one fifteen hundred fifteen thousand no, fifteen thousand just to do one function that I needed to have done and with the win automation tool I was able to do it myself and I you know it's just not that expensive of a tool. So Michelle's saying I hate programming, I hate programming. It worked. I love programming. <laughs> exactly, Michelle. <laughs> Petra is saying she can relate to Michelle. And Ramesh is glad to be here. Good to see you again, Ramesh. Uh, okay, we're going to put this up because Nikolai's starting it. I wasn't going to go there, Nikolai. Hey, believe me, it was here before I came. Okay. Um, but th but then again, you know, I've got a history working with multiple document review tools. I think I started in the early days with the concordance stuff and then moved on to summation and, you know, learned how to program DII files, you know, in my sleep and edit them in my sleep. And then I, I moved off to, uh, yep, and then I moved off to uh, case logistics, which was another tool that came, was it was at the law firm before I started. And I learned, uh, I learned case logistics. And actually, interestingly enough, case logistics, its production tool, didn't produce PDF files, which kind of was odd. It could not. What did you say? It could not. It could not. not. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the so we needed to. production module couldn't produce PDF? Exactly. Exactly. And for years. Logistics. And you don't want to. It's no longer a product. Because um, Thompson dropped it. And. Uh, so I said, hey, you know, I can write a production tool. And so I actually did. I hired a developer in four years. We wrote a complete production tool with, um, you know, creating TIFFs, creating PDFs, creating uh, watermarked images, uh, redaction. So it was a reverse redaction. tool that you would basically yeah. import the data that you exported out of something else? Uh, it actually worked directly with Case Logistics, okay. read the SQL databases, read the image files, did redactions. It was called Bagger. Um, so that was another acronym that I came up with. Wait, uh, Matt, oh, B, tell us what it is. B A G R. Uh, B A G R. What did it stand for? Uh, batch application to generate good electronic uh, oh, okay. something. <laughs> productions. Although I couldn't put the P in the productions, I had to use the R from productions. So. Nikolai but, is uh, here. He creates his own stuff too, and he has to name them. So I'm sure he can relate. All right. So John's yeah. saying, first he says, yucky to ringtail and then he's willing to say that he likes the ringtail analytics oh interesting i mean you know every tool i'm sure we all have done this yeah. every tool has its pluses and its minuses so nothing that i found is perfect we have some of our users that use relativity and they hate it compared yeah. to ringtail so you know it all depends on what you get used to and and um you know you make it work and that's, yeah, that's the, the people that's that's spend that's their days complaining about it instead of just getting the work done. I mean, we all vent, right? 
Yeah. But people that, that just get so focused on complaining about tools that they're, you know, they can't do anything about. The firm has made a choice. Get over yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we have options. I mean, I don't, I'm assuming that you have internal tools and then you have hosted tools. So right. you have options. And yeah, and we're we're going to be hosting some some of our stuff in Ringtail on a hosted platform, but we also offer relativity to folks that you know want a relativity platform, and it really doesn't make any difference to us. We still process the data and get it loaded for them, and so choices. That's what it's all about: choices. Okay, so um, we have one more tool, and this one I'm really curious about your uh, perspective on it. Um, I have some friends that have talked about it, some friends that have implemented it for other people. As a consultant, um, I know nothing about it. You mentioned it during one of my shows previously, and then I went yeah. and looked at it. I really liked the the founders of the company. I think there's three of them, uh, two guys and a girl, uh, who came from legal. So it's another one of the companies that, you know, we know what you do for your job. We know what you do for a living, so we're best at creating software for you. So let's talk about this one. Yeah, this is a tool that I was seeking because when I first came to this firm to kind of organize the litigation support department, what we were doing here, as I'm sure many of you do, is we have Excel spreadsheets, we have Outlook emails, we have documents in the DMS system, we have some access databases, we have some databases in Ringtail that's keeping track of projects and requests and tasks and billing. Mm -hmm. And so basically the data was spread all over creation and I wanted to have a centralized tool and I had previously developed a SharePoint tool at my other firm uh, to, manage, to manage the litigation support department. So I was fully prepared to implement another new uh, SharePoint tool and my boss said, well, I don't want you to develop a tool that we're not going to be able to support. So luckily, uh, Agility Blue which is made by Sadie Blue Software, came on the market. And so I was one of the early adopters to it. I know the developer personally. And uh, actually, it's part of the company that I used to work at. Uh, you know, and they use this tool to manage their, uh, the vendor uh, ticketing system. And so you know, we adopted uh, Agility Blue. I migrated all of the data from all of the spreadsheets, from all of the Ringtail databases, from all of the Word documents, from all of the other places, centralized it all into Agility Blue. And I really, I, I got to tell you, I just love this tool uh, because it's totally geared towards the litigation support departments. This is how we run our litigation support department. All of our requests come in through email. Those are then transferred into tickets, into Agility Blue. Those are assigned to technicians within the department. They automatically get notification that they've got a ticket assigned to them. They work on a task. They put in the billing information into the task, into the project. They put in the media. If there's media associated with it, if there's attachment files, they add the attachment files. They put in comments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really managing the entire workflow of the litigation support department from beginning to end. In fact, this morning I was just running my monthly billing reports out of the system, so I'll be submitting the billing information to our accounting department for month-end billing uh, out of Agility Blue. It's extremely customizable. You can add your own custom fields to it. You can add your own uh, visual displays to it. So if you have different columns that you want to see, you can uh, build those into the tools. Pretty much any custom reports that I wanted to do have done were, you know, done within a few weeks, literally. Um, so I have management reports of, you know, who are the top requesters, what's the volume of data that I'm processing on a monthly basis, uh, you know, what's my billing on a weekly basis and on a monthly basis, productivity, you know, how many tasks each one of the team members is doing on a weekly or, a, you know, whatever basis that I want to request. Um, it's you know it's just it's just a tool that makes our lives a lot easier within the litigation support support department. It's all based okay, on client so matter yes. number. So, so. I have about twelve questions. Oh, okay. You ready? Yeah. So you mentioned it, that you enter they enter their time entry into it, and now you mentioned that you're exporting it and giving it to accounting. So my first question was going to be, does it have integration with Elite? Because you mentioned you have Elite. So yes, what are, they what are, are you built doing with they, time entry. 
they are building an integration with Elite. They just announced the API with the tool so that they can do, they, they already integrate now with Relativity. So when you create a, a case within Agility Blue, they're able to actually create a case within Relativity dynamically. And they're, <clears throat> they're hoping to do more integration with more tools. And one of them is Elite to get the time entry automatically into Elite from Agility Blue. You just mentioned that you do it monthly, but that wouldn't be good enough time entry. Well, depends on the firm you work at, right? When you have to have your time entry in, is that is yours monthly? So, well, we do both. Uh, two weeks, so we, we do both hourly billing for some of the matters that we work on, and we do consulting. So those have to go in on a weekly basis, and then uh, at the end of the month, we do storage based billing. So it's it's two two types of billing that I have to do. All right, so one of the problems that we've had in the past with the litigation support team having tracking tools is that we're in and out of multiple tools, like you alluded to earlier, almost typing the same information in multiple tools, and then you've got email, right? So in mm -hmm. terms of, I never wanted to implement a tool for my team that caused them to do double entry. You know, they're already doing their job and then I have to make them describe what they did on their job plus do their time entry. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So they yeah. type an email yeah. to the attorney and then they go into whatever software and type what they told the attorney to do, you know, what they told mm -hmm. the attorney or copy and paste or whatever. And then they have to go into time entry and do their time. So it's good that you said they're doing their time entry in here, but how do they respond? Does it have integration with Outlook so that you know, is there an inbox in Agility Blue, so to speak? Yes, you do have the ability, although we don't use it, you do have the ability to send an email to Agility Blue and then that will create a ticket for you. Yeah. There's also a, there's also a portal feature, an end user portal feature where they end user can log in and see their their requests and they yeah. can also submit new tickets into Agility Blue. Uh, there's so also a new feature. Do that. They're just going to email you. No. No, they just email us. So the other feature that we've asked for, and they're in the process of implementing well, probably in the next month or so, is the ability to have what are called templates. And so we have email templates. For instance, when we do a processing job, we specify you know the number of files and the file types and you know the output processing and any errors that happen. All that is f fielded information that yeah, we so enter we into. Plug in the field. Yeah. Values and then what, the email. What, what we're going to do is we'll create a template which will have all those fields values that'll be substituted. And then we can actually email a template that will automatically generate an email with that field value in it. And so that will eliminate us cutting and pasting information into the email and be able to send that information. And we'll be able to dynamically create pretty much any kind of notification template that we want using the information that's in Agility Blue. So that'd be a very powerful feature that I'm looking forward to see. So how long have you had it? Uh, we've had it a little two and a half years. No, okay. yeah. Uh, so what it's. Did you, uh, you know the programmer from a previous. Yeah, I know the developer. Uh, you know, he's uh, a personal friend of mine, as as well as uh, you know, helping you know, kind of get it off the ground. We were an alpha uh, site for it. We were a beta okay. site for it, and so we're. He's he's constantly taking, luckily, uh, suggestions from me to yeah. make improvements, which yeah. you know helps me a lot. But I think it helps generally the product as well. Of course. And uh, so. So um, the person, your team members that are in it all day, uh, what, mm -hmm. what I want, I wanted some way for a centralized um, place where the team, let me say it differently, people are, at, are out of the office and I want so-and-so to cover their cases. Or on a day-to-day -day basis, I wanted all team members to know what all team members were working on, right? Mm -hmm. Because they would need to pitch hit, you know, um, you know, at the last minute. So I had, a t of course, a team email and all the emails came in. And, and you, even if you weren't managing that case, you would skim the email to make sure you knew yep. sort of what was going on. Or at least you had the emails that if you were, you know, filling in the next day, you know, the person had to take a day off, that you could at least go back to them for, you know, the emails that are there for to see what the last few things happened in the last week or so. And I assume that all your team members can see each other's tickets, so mm -hmm. to speak, right? So yeah, and I as a and I as a manager or something. Yeah, and I as a manager can go in and look at uh, the overall team's workload. Uh, and the nice thing is you can customize what are called views, so you can have these custom views of the product. So I have views for 
you know, open tasks for Susie and open tasks for Tim and closed tasks for this and, you know, what are overdue tasks and what are due in the next seven day tasks and things like that. So I can constantly monitor. In addition to that, every time one of the staff members enters a, a ticket, I get an automatic notification that a new yeah. ticket has been been entered. So I'll often, you know, see the new ticket and I'll see something in there and I'll go, oh, I have a solution for that. Let me go talk to that person because maybe they haven't worked with, you know, how to extract data out of an iPhone backup file, which was kind of one of the latest ones that we had. So does it have, um, so what's the back end? Is it SaaS based? You know, or do you install it locally? I think it was SaaS based. I think I saw on the website. Yeah, they it, do all the maintenance a, behind the scenes for you. Um, right. Hi, Rahul. Glad to see you here. Uh, Rahul's another team member in India. Um, and so that answers that. Uh, yeah, then, it's all web-based. Okay. And then um, lost my train of thought. Uh, it was about... It's age. No, it was Rahul. I said hi to, I said hi to Rahul. Um, Rahul <laughs> disrupted me. It was about the... Um, the back end? Web-based. Was one was back end and one was something else, so I lost it. It'll be lost forever okay. until later this afternoon. I'll email you. But All right. Just, um, do you, do, how do you onboard your team member for such a um, – how do you onboard a team member into Agility Blue? Do you have somebody show them on the team, show the new person how to use it? Yeah, and, and thankfully I, I have a great team who's been here uh, a long, long time. I mean, one of, okay, one of my staff members has been here 12 years. Yeah. Uh, another one has been here five years. Another one's been here three years. Uh, oh, but they, great they, boss. Yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> watch his videos all day. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, but no, it takes, you know, probably an hour or so to, to get people up to speed. And then I, I'm very much a written procedures guy. Yeah. So since I've been here, I've probably written probably 100 or 150 different procedures on how to do various things. And so that's all for well documented with screenshots of how to do this and how to do that. So, okay. All right. It's, uh, well, it's good. To, I mean, I'm glad that you, I know you mentioned it before, but I didn't get a chance to talk to you about it. So it's good if it comes up again in my you know, pathway, I'll know that Wade loves it, so I probably would too. You know, there aren't a lot of tools out there, unfortunately, for managing a litigation support department. I've looked at a few of the project management tools. Some are very expensive. Yeah. They're not very flexible. Um, and this is really the, there's really the only one that's... There's a few, there's a few that few. try to manage that do project management for the lawyer teams. You know, right. even when I went to their website, it says project management software for legal teams. I'm like, are you talking lawyers or are you talking us? Because we, yeah. you started out by describing that it's perfect for lit support because what we do is slightly different and how yes. we manage our cases, you know, yes. and how we interact with them and our team members. It's all a little bit different than the attorney legal team side, you know, and the paralegal and stuff like that. Yeah, we have to keep track of media, chain of custody, you know, billing information, um, production specifications, ESI stipulations, things like that. So, you know, all of that can be put into the system. I remembered my question. So okay. does it have um, canned responses? Does it have a way to have a knowledge base that's being built as they're replying to things? So it's a ticketing system that you can communicate in and out of the system with, I assume, like any help desk ticketing system. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So usually there is a knowledge base that gets built dynamically, you know, as a Q&A happens. The Q and A gets added to the knowledge base, and then when the next time somebody asks the same question, you can just here's a link to the answer to your question, which I'm sure in a law firm, as opposed to a SaaS company, you know that might not be as welcome from them. Here's your standard answer from our knowledge base, but yeah. I guess does it have does it build a knowledge base of standard things your team deals with, or do they just search against all the tickets? No, it doesn't have that built in. It could, I mean, because there's the ability to have comments on tasks and replies to comments on tasks, as well as attachments uh, to tasks. And that could all be coupled together or bundled together into a knowledge engine with a search tool. It has a search tool in it, but it's basically just kind of searching across all the tickets okay. and the solutions. Okay. And what we tend to do is we tend to document things in procedure 
documents rather than have it posted in the document. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, you guys, um, since there's a delay in the comments, if you have anything else to ask Wade or any comments or just, you know, want to say hi again, let me know because we're going to sign off in a bit. Um, Wade, let me know, let them know where they can go to buy Dat Daddy. Uh, the website? In the beginning, but I always ask at the end. Where do we That's great. It? Uh, go to www.enfdiscovery.com. And, and you'll also. Is related to another project you worked on, right? Right. Uh, okay. Encapsulated native files. Right. So if you go to that website and you uh, get distracted with his other interests, I didn't want to talk about it today because it's really geeky and yeah, it's some of my audience couldn't handle it, but um, I mean, it's just it's very. So far. Very futuristic thinking. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but, um, you know, people like John Randall and uh, Ramesh, I mean, they can handle it. So if you go to the website and you see it, uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. That's how I originally found you, Wade. Uh, oh, okay. I was okay. Googling or something. I forget yeah. how I found it, but that's how I originally found you. And, and I, I read about it. I read what you had on there. Maybe you were posting it on LinkedIn back then. Um, yeah. And then I, I said, this guy's pretty smart. I love the way, I love people that think outside the box. And so I was immediately attracted to you, just so you know. Yeah, this, uh, this ENF idea I came up with, uh, I think, could revolutionize production delivery. So, Okay. But, thank, gonna... but thank you so thanks much, Amy, to... for having me on your show. And yeah, thanks for saying Really this. enjoyed it. And I'll let you back to work. So everybody have a great weekend, and we'll be back here next week with another guest. Bye.